Hello, everyone. Welcome to Mortgages and Markets. It is May the 8th, 2020. And we have, of course, Sam Bikili is with us. He's in the car. I'm pretty sure he has said something wrong to somebody and has been banished <laughs> in his t-shirt in three degree weather. Sam, glad you're there. I hope that coffee is warm. So <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. You know, I figured I would just change it up. Give us a little different of a backdrop today. S change it up as in getting away from people and hiding and in your own little uh, version exactly. of uh, quarantine, that a boy, that a boy. Exactly. All right. So quick shameless plug, folks. Uh, we have our full podcast coming up uh, this Wednesday, part one of two, Peter Catini, George Duby, the incredible magical accountants from BDO. We're going to be talking about a whole bunch of stuff, including what CRA could be doing to come and get some money from you. So make sure you listen into that on uh, Wednesday to be posted on all your favorite podcatchers. All right, Sam, let's get into some news and happenings and fun stuff. So first thing, and I'm going to quickly share my screen here so everybody can see. So uh, first thing that came up uh, just hot off the press this morning is Canadian employment. Funny how they call it employment numbers as opposed to unemployment. <laughs> unemployment. But that's yeah. right. <laughs> Glass half full, man. It's all about the bank, buddy. So, okay. So we've got, I mean, no one here I think is shocked that this has happened, but unemployment rate spiked 13%. Uh, but I think a very most important, and I'm hoping people can see this, they have broken down what the type of layoffs are, okay? So temporary, some were permanent, and some who are looking for work and not looking for work. So I think this is going to have some impact. What are you seeing? Well, we actually saw the same thing happening with the states today. They came out with their equivalent of the unemployment or employment numbers, yep. however you want to look at it. And um, oddly enough, the market's shaking it off again. I think there's a bit of a, maybe there's an expectation that kind of to your point, this is self-inflicted, so it should be relatively simple to rebound or at least open the doors, um, you know, with the furlogging, with the, the, the fact that unemployment numbers are a lagging indicator, right? We're, we're looking at what has happened in the past, and so markets try to look at what's going on in the future, and the, maybe the, the expectation that we can rebound from that is not necessarily playing out the way that we're expecting because week after week, we just keep seeing more people, more people but the markets keep finding ways to keep going up. So I think there's, it's kind of that, that glass kind of half full mentality to your point of maybe this is just temporary. We can get out of this and back to normal. I'm seeing that too. I, I think, I don't think anyone knows what the heck to do. And I think everyone's holding on to the hope and let's call it hope that this is a temporary thing. I know I'm seeing it where people are going back to work. So obviously locally, uh, Toyota, right? In Cambridge, they're all going back on Monday, okay? Mm -hmm. um, I'm also reading here, I mean, if we look at this one paragraph, as ugly as the economical, economic data is going to look for April, there are also some green shoots to suggest. So they're talking about the bottom of the downturn, okay? So, you know, are we going to see a V shape, a U shape? So I'm like, I'm liking the fact that people are actually talking about some positive stuff and that, you know what, this actually might be a temporary thing. Fingers crossed, right? Yeah. And the other part of it is, you know, where are these unemployment numbers coming from? It's kind of showing you on, the, on that little chart in the left, right? It's the same idea on, on the American side is we're seeing a lot of it from specific industries and sectors. It's not necessarily a widespread issue that's right. happening in every, well, I mean, I shouldn't say that it's not, it's less, less so in certain industries. Yeah. So, you know, when you put those two together, you know, there's some noise perhaps in the unemployment numbers that you could find some glimmers of hope. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I guess my message out there to people is as well, you know, it's, it could be temporary, you know, it's, let's just wait and see before you kind of go and jump off that cliff. Let's just make sure that that's actually what the case is. Right. So yeah. now to play the devil's advocate, we'll see how this, how long this plays out. Right. Yeah. If we do see a kind of a slower back to normalcy or a reclosing for a second lockdown, this changes things drastically. Uh, I was I was watching a show on Netflix. They were talking about the pandemic and how it all works. And, uh, you know, they were saying that's probably one of the bigger concerns is if it spikes again and we get locked down again, you know, is it 
is it going to be a longer term lockdown so it doesn't happen a third time or is it going to be a temporary one even less temporary just to get our house in order and then off we go again time will tell right time will tell i just like uh, that nobody is quite jumping off the cliff yet so yeah i don't want to find out what this looks like during the winter because standing in lines is going to be a lot worse in <laughs> minus 25 degree canadian tundra i dropped off my daughter at she was working part-time at a grocery store and the senior hours between 7 and 8 a.m well it was freezing cold yesterday morning i dropped her off at 7 15 and there was a lineup of 15 seniors waiting in two degree weather and it was freezing cold. And I was like, Oh man, this is not good. You know, if, yeah. uh, yeah. So anyway, all right, moving on. So, uh, again, from the, from the file of, uh, not shocking this guy, uh, obviously the Canadian housing market dropped in April. So we saw it in March where it was only half a month of drop. Now we've got a full month right in the heat of this thing. And obviously, everything has dropped. Now, one thing I'm noticing is prices have not. If anything, they have increased. We had that glutton of buyers that was looking, but just the overall numbers have dropped, right? For resales in particular, because they break out resales in new homes. So I know in, in our world, we know it's happening, but I will say the last week or so, we got everyone kind of coming out and they're like, okay, what can I afford? Rates are low. This is a good thing. So in our world on mortgage side, this is good. People are starting to get out there. We've got virtual open houses. We've got Zoom tours going, Facebook Live, and stuff is moving. We have multiples going on in Cambridge, for example, at a 550, 600 price point. So that sort of stuff is happening. What are you seeing on the market relative to... Um, rates uh and when i talk about rates we're talking any rates that impact mortgage rates and anything that you're seeing that's gonna that's gonna have a uh, an effect based on some of these declines well you know i don't know that there's necessarily a really strong positive correlation between what the markets are going to do and real estate assets you know when you think about on um, if you were to try and invest in um for example REITs there are certain areas that are arguably a lot more attractive or the valuations are more in line or just the fact that the prices are much more attractive compared to the way that they were, especially in things like the retail space and hospitality and whatnot. Um, but, you know, I think this ends up becoming kind of a, a, the challenge that is somewhat different is there is such an aggressive demand, in my opinion, in this area or even in kind of the greater Golden Horseshoe area for housing that I, I wonder if it can really, it can just weather that downturn of even 15%, 20% unemployment because there's so many people out there trying to buy houses. Yeah. You know, I have two friends and again, these are kind of starter homes admittedly, but nonetheless, they are still saying, Hey, like when this opens back up, should I be getting out there? Should I be putting in offers? Should I be looking at new builds? You know, nothing's the answer really is changed. yes. <laughs> there you go right um, my mortgage guy said <laughs> yeah exactly this guy i know so that's kind of the, the 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 state we're in especially we're going into that hot housing market right this is the summer isn't this the big time for for housing may kind of into june yep exactly and this is what so here's a key point here april again same as the last set of numbers april could prove to be the cynical uh, silico low point for home resales. So um, because some provinces are now beginning to ease social distancing. Listen, people got to buy and sell homes. It's going to happen. I was just on a call with, um, with a group of realtors that I work with. And they said, as all these people are going to be working from home, probably going forward permanently, guess what? Kitchen table is not an office. They're going to need to move. That sort of thing is going to happen. I look at my family. We cook a lot more now. We yeah, might need a oh bigger yeah. kitchen. So Housing is going to have to move for completely, possibly different reasons, right? It's funny. I was actually talking to one of my friends who's, um, he's kind of a contractor. He does this stuff for fun. And we were joking, like, are we going to get to a point where you're going to see an increase in renovations? Because we're going to probably see more staycations, more people that realize, you know what, this is probably the perfect time to upgrade or, or renovate or touch up or whatever you want to call it for you know, a, a multitude of reasons. So I wouldn't be surprised if that ends up being the case. Yeah. Well, listen, Hey, just show of hands. Who's not traveling this. Who's not flying this summer 
because there's other things going on and you're worried about money like right here. Yeah. Right. So, and I, and usually in the summer we don't travel outside of the Canadian border, but you know what? I mean, unless we can get a special on something, we're not flying. It's going to happen. And, and you know, good luck if you're in travel from the standpoint that that's going to be like a U uh, a U shaped recovery, almost guaranteed, especially if borders are closed. Right. Yeah. The, the, the challenge that they're going to be faced with is how do they reopen? You know, you're seeing most industries yeah. shift to the point where they're accepting a, a difference in um, behaviors. But right now, we're going to probably have to see either, you know, what half capacity on planes, which either means a, the prices go up or they just reduce the amount of flights. And yeah. yeah. So I more to come on that one. That's for sure. So, all right, last one. So uh, Australia, Australia became kind of a, a focus this week. I don't know if it was just popular to talk about, you know, the nice Australian people, but they're doing, I think you mentioned this, uh, the three step or three, three prong, three prong yeah. approach to, to trying to curb this thing. And uh, I'll let you talk about that in a sec, but I will say Australia has got some interesting things going on where th they actually, I think they've made it very close to mandatory. You must be tracked via your smartphone or some other device to see if you've got this or not. So they can figure out and test the appropriate people. And I, I remember reading a little bit about this and it was uh, the interviewer said, well, how are you getting around the whole privacy thing? And the lady said, and actually the lady is, I believe she's the head of the economic something or other, very high up there. And she said, well, it's a trade-off. Do you want your economy open or do you want to be tracked? And she said, the Australian people have said, well, track me so we can get this thing moving. Right. So, mm -hmm. uh, but the three, the three prong approach uh, just briefly, go ahead and jump into it. So, um, you know, and I think most countries are starting to embrace this in some capacity, the testing, the tracing, and the isolating. It, this seems to be kind of the, the buzzwords that in, in any way that we're going to get back to some form of normalcy, we need to be able to, to withstand a second wave. Or even just the people that are going to get sick because it's going to happen. We need to be able to have the medical facilities for them, et cetera. So I don't know if the, the the tracing and is mandatory per se, but it seems to be embraced, which is a big, big thing because you Good know word. if people do it, then it's kind of like, you know, you're only strong as your weakest link. So, you know, as we get to the point that hopefully Canada and the rest of the world can actually test this, can figure out where it's coming from, can stop the spread, can isolate people and quarantine specific pockets where necessary, then hopefully we don't go down the road of a mass lockdown like this. And this just yeah. becomes a distant memory, right? So I think that seems to be, you know, I was watching something on, on how sports are going to open back up. Cause I think, you know, some of us are a little anxious to, to see another game at some point, finish the season. And it's a little bit of the same idea. In order for them to do that, they need to be testing those individuals, those players almost daily, right? They need to be able to get them out of the lockers and out of the facilities if they are sick. Yeah. Now, again, the, the challenge here is, are there enough testing kits to do that? And yeah. probably the answer is no, because if you're going to have that many testing kits diverted to sports, well, those are testing kits that could be used elsewhere. I was thinking arguably, the same thing. Right. You know, and I'm not going to get into the ethics of, you know, who deserves it more, but I'm sure everybody has their own opinion on that. So unless we get to an abundance of testing kits, that could become an ethical issue at some point. Yeah. Oh, and it will guaranteed guaranteed. I mean, in the U S it's endless and the U S they're, they're in a bad spot right now. That is not a good place to be right now. They've got turmoil the whole bit. Uh, but I think up here, I'm hoping we have our kind of our wits about us and, you know, can pri how do you prior, I was going to say prioritize, but how do you do that? Like, you know, I don't know. Good luck. I think, I was. I think BC actually came out with their 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 beginning plans of how to reopen the economy and their phases and their their timelines and all of that. And I don't. That's definitely above my pay grade. You know, I yeah. don't know how you determine. You know, they were even talking about what happens in a scenario where you are maximum capacity in the hospital and the yeah. doctor has to decide who gets put on life support or ventilators or whatever it's called. So that's what was happening in Italy. I was talking to a yeah, doctor exactly. and they said in Italy, and this was back in March in Italy, they had to decide if you are 65 and older, you are not getting a ventilator. They had to make a choice. That age group was a lower priority. We never want to be in that world. I get it. No. How do we do it again? I'm like you, man, that's way over my pay grade. That's for sure. So yeah. 
All right, Sam, thank you for everything, bud. Hey, stay warm. Uh, I know you're coming to us from the set of Pimp My Ride, which is fantastic. And uh, <laughs> have an awesome week, buddy. Thank, as, thank you as always for your insight. And uh, to everyone else, don't forget, this coming Wednesday, uh, Green Effect Podcast, George and Peter will be on. Be safe, be healthy, and we'll talk to you soon. Take care, everybody. Talk soon. Bye-bye.